Welcome to this OST tool lecture about how to set up your lab environment for the exercises in this course. We provide ready to use environment using Docker and we recommend this environment because this protects you from breaking your own system if it already has a TPM. If you're using a work machine or you're a student and your machine is being managed by the organization, then it is very likely that the TPM is already in use by Microsoft Windows or by Linux. And we don't want you to have problems doing this course. Therefore, we recommend using Docker locally on your machine. It is very easy to use and we provide a container that is ready to be downloaded and just run on your local system. All the instructions are available in the course. There is a third option for running the exercise, and this is with a hardware TPM. This is, of course, possible. Just be aware of the risks. For most of the exercises, we'll be using the TPM2 tools. For when we get behind the scenes and see how actually the TPM operations happen using an API from a TPM software stack, then we'll discuss more about the software stack of choice. For now, you just need the TPM2 tools if you decide to use a hardware TPM. Here is a typical workflow when using our Docker environment locally. On the next slide, we'll show a video demo of this exact flow. First, we need to instruct Docker to fetch our image from the Docker Hub. This image already exists, this container, it's being downloaded, then an image is created. Once the image is created, the container is actually being run and we are attaching an interactive terminal so we can issue our comments. The first one being a TPM server. The TPM server is actually the IBM's TPM simulator made by Ken Goldman. The TPM log can be observed for how the TPM simulator works. Usually you don't have to do that, but it's there if you decide to do so. The very first command we issue to the TPM is a startup. If this was a real physical system, the startup command would already be issued by the UFI or BIOS or the just the first firmware that initializes the system. In this case, because it's a simulator, we just started it, we need to do the command ourselves. And there is an easy to use tool to do that. Just don't forget the dash lowercase c argument there. Once the TPM is startup, we can start issuing any TPM command and as many TPM commands as you like. The TPM to startup command is needed only after the TPM server is started. After that, it's no longer needed. It's only one time execution. For this example, to verify that the TPM simulator is working, we're just going to generate some random bytes. To be exact, four random bytes. And we're going, going to use the TPM to as a source of randomness. After that, We'll print the stored file and we'll see that did we get four bytes. So let's see the demo. Here, we already downloaded the Docker container that's available in the Docker Hub. And our local Docker has created an image based on that container with some extra parameters that you see more instructions in the course. Then we run the TPM server, we issue the startup command, we ask the TPM to generate us four bytes, we receive the bytes, and we can see that we got um, the first byte is BB, the second one is uh, 93, this is in hex, third one is 50, and the last one is E7. This is just an example of how easy it is to use the Docker environment from OST2 for this course. It is up to you to decide, do you prefer a hardware TPM or a software TPM with our Docker environment? And there's also an option to run it in a browser so we don't have to install anything. More information you can find in the course itself. Now, the local setup has only one major requirement and this is to be able to run a fairly recent version of Docker. Then there are several recommended options to make your experience better. Most importantly, the TPM2 tools need to know how to talk with the TPM simulator. And for that, there is an option. You can set this option once you are inside the Docker container with your interactive shell or set it as an argument as shown on the screen. This comment is also available in the course description when we talk about the local setup. And I prefer this way because once this is set on the Docker command line, and it's true for the complete execution, 
of the container until we exit. And this makes it very easy and um, just simplifies using the TPM2 tools. Now, the other important option that depends on your system is to specify that the container we provide is for Linux and x86 64-bit system. This is particularly useful and needed if you are using uh, ARM-based Apple MacBook M1, M2, M3, or some of the newer generations that will be coming out. And of course, you need some kind of a terminal application to operate with uh, Docker. Docker itself offers a GUI that has a way to provide you interactive shell. However, I recommend having a separate terminal application. Uh, one is provided nowadays with Windows, Linux, and on Macs. So just uh, look in your um, application menu, you would uh, find it. Then we have the next one, which is a really, I think, neat application of Docker. This is a website that generates on-demand instance of Docker, and we can run up to four hours. Uh, there's no limit as far as I could see when using this uh, solution that is supported by Docker itself. They're offsetting the cost of the website, the hosting and the, and the resources it uses. So you can just go there and log in with your Docker account. Uh, typically this requires no charge. It's a free of charge account from hub.docker.com. I find it very useful for testing, for doing the exercises. It's rather quick. Uh, once you've downloaded the container from the hub, it just starts very fast and the resources available are plenty for our needs. Um, there are limitations, as I mentioned, one Docker instance at a time. So if you're doing something, uh, let's say we're doing one exercise and you want to start doing another one in parallel, this wouldn't be possible. Also, there's the limit of four hours that I never could really hit. And even uh, one or two times when I just forgot the window open and it ran out, I was just able to close that instance and start a new instance. So this four hour limit is more of a timeout rather than an actual limitation per day. So you can use this environment for more than four hours. You will just need to restart your instance. And our exercises really do not require like a one exercise alone wouldn't take up to four hours. Depending on the exercise, it could take five, 10 minutes or more, but it, it wouldn't be four hours in any case. So this is a really good uh, solution. And um, it is something I often use to try out different things with the TPM simulator. Not to forget the same options uh, would be required here as well, because this is just Docker running on someone else's computer and you're having the visual uh, interface, the terminal in front of you. So just not for, don't forget the options from the previous slide. If you decide to use a hardware TPM, you just need to install the TPM2 TSS software stack and the TPM2 tools. Both are open source and have very good instructions for all of the popular operating systems, how to install. Just remember that um, on a Mac environment, you would need the TPM simulator, or you can get a um, TPM to go on a USB stick uh, from Let's Trust. Now, because of these complications and risk of breaking your machine, again, I would recommend using the Docker environment. If you want to use a hybrid TPM, using our Docker image would not benefit you greatly. Um, you could in theory connect the hardware TPM with the Docker image somehow for the communication, but it's not really beneficial. So if you decide to use the hardware TPM, just make sure to install the software and be aware that your system might not boot if it's being managed by your organization. If it's your personal machine, then again, please check first your operating system if it has uh, any extra security feature enabled that is already using the TPM. And that's it. A typical lab workflow is shown here. Um, the descriptions are made to be intuitive. Uh, we're not uh, making uh, hardly technical descriptions, but rather an example would be create a digital signature using the TPM or seal a secret using the TPM. And based on the information that you would hear and learn from the lectures, you will have all the information necessary to solve these challenges. Once you read the description, the recommendation is to go and try to solve it by yourself. If you experience difficulty, then uh, we usually put all the important TPM2 tools links Let's say for the digital signature, it would be a link to TPM2 sign and the TPM2 verify tools where you can read about the different options. And by reading through, you would probably remember something we said during the lecture and be, oh, okay, so I see 
This is the option I need. This is what I need to instruct the TPM to do. Now, once you've done that and you've tried again, and if, you, if you're still experiencing difficulties, which is very possible if you're a newcomer, a beginner, the TPM has complexity, has a high know-how barrier. This is why we created these courses to help lower that barrier. That's totally okay. We're providing solution videos in each of the labs, each exercise, after its description, after the links to the tools documentation for the specific exercise, we have a solution video that shows you exactly how we envision to solve this problem. And then I would really suggest don't be satisfied with just seeing how it should work. Try out the, the instructions and if you have any issues, just let us know in the OST2 discussion box. Uh, each exercise, each unit with an exercise has a discussion box. Feel free to drop any questions there. and. Of course, experiment further once you get it right, once you get it working. And if you want to do something more, we'll be happy to try to answer any questions about continuing the workflow of a specific, specific exercise, making more of the digital signature or something else.